This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. Uh, we're very pleased to be joined by a good friend of the Mises Institute, Nick Sorrentino. He is the proprietor of a website I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but you ought to be, againstcronycapitalism.org. And I'd like to mention that one of our board members, Hunter Lewis, is also a proprietor and a founder of that site. Hunter is, of course, the author of Where Keynes Went Wrong, and a new book in the same vein called uh, Where Bernie Went Wrong, which is now available on Amazon. It's also available at againstcronycapitalism.org. So uh, that said, Nick, uh, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to talk to you, Jeff. Well, before we get into your site and what your site is all about, let's just pause for a moment and talk about Trump's infrastructure plan, which is being heralded now. I read a little bit about it this morning. It's not actually as bad as we might have feared and as David Stockman might have feared it. It supposedly involves some mix of private funding and tax credits as opposed to just naked uh, transportation department funding. But you know, you, you got to imagine that any kind of broad-based infrastructure boondoggle run by the federal government is going to be wholly politicized. It's going to be like Tennessee Valley Authority. There's going to be winners and losers. And and it, it sounds to me like a deplorable idea. So I'd like to get your take on it. I totally agree. Um, essentially, when we, when we funnel billions and maybe even trillions over long term uh, through uh, the federal government for any sort of project, it, there's just going to be uh, crony capitalism embedded in it. That's just the nature of things. Um, people are going to get sweetheart deals. Money's going to be siphoned this way and that. Connected are going to get paid. And those who are on the outside are going to remain on the outside. You know, as as we were saying before we uh, we went online here, um, it's pro- economic reality is probably going to set in here and uh, curtail a lot of these plans anyway. And frankly, for the country, that's probably a good thing. Well, your site is called Against Crony Capitalism. Let's just get your sort of high-level take. How how would you define crony capitalism for us? Crony capitalism is when interests, and uh, it can be business, but it can also be unions. It can also be people within government. um, Use the government essentially to line their pockets. Um, it can be sweetheart deals, um, you know, in infrastructure. It could be defense. It can be, you know, just ridiculous pay for uh, people within the government who don't really do much. Uh, it takes many, many forms. But what it comes down to is it costs the average taxpayer, the people on the outside, um, money. And that's not fair. Of course, life is not fair either, though. Yeah, but what's interesting is this idea of people on the outside, which I think by definition is most people, right? In other words, cronyism is is limited to a select few, which seems to be the case throughout history. It is indeed the case, and it, it is my opinion that that cronyism, crony capitalism, is kind of the default human state of affairs when it comes to a government and society. Going back to uh, Hammurabi, I'm sure there were, you know, there's some guy trying to find um, a way to benefit from irrigation canals from the Euphrates or something, you know. I mean, it's just the way it is. However, uh, that isn't to say that it shouldn't be and must be fought. It can be reduced and a uh, better, more, um, and in the end, more prosperous society uh, can result if we fight this tendency. Well, you ran an article on your site, I guess about a week ago now from CNBC. It's the 52 public companies publicly held that make the most money from the federal government. You mentioned defense contracting. Of course, let me list a few of these for for our listeners. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, uh, BAE system. So a, a lot of defense contractors are on that list. And this seems to me this is really the, the the classic, direct, understandable case of crony capitalism, right? When a, a big company has lobbyists and builds products directly for the federal government and sells those products to the government, whether the, the, the government actually needs them, whether they're any good, whether the price is fair, uh, whether the people who vote for the government want them, uh, and they get money directly from, let's say, the Defense Department. Th- this is this – is, sort of your archetypical example of crony capitalism, like a Lockheed Martin? 
I would absolutely agree with this. Uh, interestingly, Trump appears to agree with this also, which is interesting. Uh, you know, uh, there's a reason why, and, I, and let me preface this by saying that I am a child of the defense industry in many respects. <laughs> I won't go into further detail, although I never worked in it. My family has in many capacities. Uh, but there's a reason why uh, Loudoun County, Virginia, is the wealthiest county in the United States. It just it is also where uh, you know the defense industry is largely based. You know, uh, people who say that they are um, you know quote conservative, this is the kind of spending that many conservatives, and I see it online uh, at our site. This is the type of spending that a lot of conservatives turn a blind eye to. And what's funny is that it really is some of the most crony and biggest spending there is. Right. Uh, and then, frankly, it's something that, that people who believe in a smaller government or at least really, really believe in a smaller government, really, we need to address this. It is it is a sacred cow that needs to be slayed as a slain, as the, uh, the Washington Examiner uh, said two days ago. So a, a Lockheed Martin or General Dynamics, we can understand that. Let's take this down to a more micro level, though. What about a small town? I live in a nice college town of Auburn, Alabama, and the town is is booming with new developments, new condos, even some small high rises, lots of new restaurants. Uh, you know, the cronyism can exist on a smaller scale, right? If somebody in a town like Auburn is uh, friendly with the mayor and the city council and, and and has some advanced knowledge of what might be going on with zoning and building. And that person avails themselves of that knowledge to buy some property. And lo and behold, a couple years later, they sell it at a huge profit because there's a shopping mall that's approved by the city. Uh, th- this is a form of crony capitalism in your hometown, if I'm correct. Uh, you are absolutely correct. And I also live in a lovely small college town. Uh, we're both pretty fortunate. Uh, and yes, uh, in fact, on an everyday level, you know, this kind of cronyism may impact most of your listeners, you know, the most. There, there are all sorts of inside deals that are being made. Everybody gets a sense of it, especially real estate is a very good example. It's good that you bring that up. I look out the window and see a new uh, piece of construction um, as we speak. And not a crony piece, but in all of that mess and all of that, you know, in development, in bond issuing and, and so on, there are quiet crony deals to be made. And everybody senses it. The people on the outside, again, sense it. But there's there's a sense that there's little one can do. Right. So we're talking about fiscal payments. We're talking about people getting money directly or indirectly from government. What about the monetary policy side? Let me give you an example and see if you agree. Uh, you mentioned Loudoun County. Let's say a guy moved into Loudoun County 30 years ago and bought a modest condominium for $100,000. And as a result of both the growth in government sector and, and housing in the Washington, D.C. area, but also as a result of the Federal Reserve creating a housing bubble through what I would consider artificially low interest rates, uh, that condominium magically becomes worth $600,000. And so 30 years later, he happily sells it for $600,000. Is he, in effect, a, a, a crony capitalist himself because he didn't do anything? Let's say he put in some granite countertops and pats himself on the back, but he didn't really do anything to make a condo worth five times more. In fact, it, it, the condo is 30 years older than when he bought it. So is he is he an unholy beneficiary of an unholy system? He's probably the beneficiary of an unholy system. However, I, it, it is my opinion, and this is a point of debate often, uh, stuff like this. You can't blame somebody for just doing what they're doing. People who are in, you know, not political actors, not insiders, they're just going, you know, most people have no concept of, of monetary policy, really. And they're just doing what they're doing. And you can't blame people for that. I mean, life goes on and, and we all must operate within the system that, that exists. And right now we have a very crony system. And yeah, this person has benefited from the crony system, but uh, there are much, much bigger fish to fry. That would be my response. Sure. It, but the other thing is it makes none of us innocent. What about the guy who just has a furniture store in Loudoun County? And, it, and as a result of the housing boom, his furniture store is booming while furniture stores are struggling, uh, you know, in West Virginia or Kansas. In effect, he, he's benefiting, but it, I guess this is an example of where government taints all of us in a sense. 
the, the truth is we have a pervasive crony system. I mean, it defines our economy in many respects. And so, you know, if there's a crony reef built, the fish are going to come. And that's the furniture store guy, you know. Uh, now, it gets a little different when the furniture store guy starts getting to know the local politicians or maybe that furniture store is a big giant chain and knows and the and the proprietors know exactly what's going on and start lobbying Congress or, you know, they can, they do what they can do to uh, to make sure easy money continues. That, then that gets different. Um, it really is a matter of what can be done and chipping, you know, going after the little fish there, at least from my perspective, and this is not really your question, is not the most effective way to address the crony system. But you are absolutely correct. They are the beneficiaries of a crony system. That's why we should end the Fed. Right. So maybe the at least the, the sole proprietor furniture owner is innocent in this. Let's go uh, on this idea of monetary policy as cronyism. Let's go to some people who are not so necessarily innocent in their lack of knowledge, and that's Wall Street. So hedge funds and, and especially private equity funds. Um, if we go back to the, the mid-2000s, I was working in the M&A world, and Alan Greenspan had lowered rates uh, in response to the tech stock crash of 2000 and 2001. So uh, there was an M&A boom uh, going on at the time. And there is, a, again, today a new M&A boom, uh, not as much in the large cap arena, but in the mid cap arena that's, that's going on sort of under the radar right now. But in the, in the mid 2000s, uh, private equity firms were oftentimes buying companies using only, let's say, one part equity, their own money, to four or five or even six parts of debt you know, sliced and diced amongst a bunch of lenders. And they were oftentimes probably wildly overpaying, you know, paying 10, 11, 12 times earnings uh, for privately held companies. So this resulted in an M&A boom. It was good for people like me, who I was a lawyer in the M&A sector. So I, I guess that made me a cronyist at the time. Um, but here's a, here's a more depressing question. Let's say that the tech kid comes along with a couple other tech kids uh, in his in his college dorm room and creates a great idea, the next Facebook. And these five or six kids go out and find some venture capitalists to fund it. And uh, they, they, they say, well, we're going to take it over and run it because you guys had the great technology, the great idea, but you're, you're not businessmen. Uh, so they buy this company from the, from the tech kids for, let's say, $100 million. But we can never know, g- given what the Fed has done to price signals, we can never know if that hundred million is legitimate. Maybe they were brilliant kids. Maybe they should have gotten ten million, which means that they could have a nice condo or something. But maybe they shouldn't have gotten hundred million. Maybe they should have gotten fifty million. In other words, it, it creates this uneasy sense among us of the unjust or undeserving rich that somehow the money they've got is disproportionate to the actual value they created for society. And as David Stockman points out, we can never really know. I mean, that's what's so disconcerting about this. It's not always just Lockheed Martin uh, selling a funky aircraft to the Pentagon. You know, it, it can reveal itself in, in valuations in the M&A market that, that don't make sense to us. Well, oh, boy, that is absolutely correct. And you painted that picture beautifully. Um, no, there is, a, first, uh, uh, we, we won't know. That's one of the great crimes of, of our current monetary regime. And also to your to your other point, you know, there is such a thing as the undeserving rich. Obviously, you and I, and probably most of your listeners, would agree uh, that there is absolutely nothing wrong with being rich and and being very very rich indeed. Um, especially if one um, does so in a in a way that is moral and and honest. You know, in a dishonest system such as the monetary system we we live under, the regime we live under, you know, there are lots of people who benefit greatly, uh, who I think almost objectively could be said don't deserve to have done as well as as they have. Um, We're we're not going to know. I mean, this really does come down to the question, again, of what is to be done? (laughs) You know, uh, there, there are lots of mistakes. There's lots of blame to go around. You know, there's always a place for uh, for contemplation, but sometimes there's a time for action, and we need to uh, begin to seriously unravel the monetary system as it is currently 
constructed. And that might sound very ambitious, but I believe that uh, we're entering into a time where there may be opportunities um, that will be presented to us. Well, the, I, I agree. And the, the question is, the current wave is populist. It's not libertarian. And, you know, Washington, D.C. and the media like to, to look down on populism as anti-intellectual and dangerous. But the question becomes, if if elites became elites or remain elites because of their crony connections to government or the Fed, then it seems to me anti, anti-elitism is perfectly libertarian, uh, that we should, we should applaud this populist trend. Generally speaking, I, absolutely, I agree with that statement. Libertarianism, uh, I argue, um, is very much a, a bourgeois way of looking at the world. It benefits the middle class. Those of us who you know, don't necessarily come from wealth, money, and connections, you know, a free market's a good thing for us as so long as we want to work. Whereas a crony system establishes and protects an aristocracy. And that is what we have today. So in that sense, yes, indeed, we should we should cheer on much of the populism, not all of it, but much of it yeah. um, that we see today. Well, I think you're so right. I think we do have a, a, not a landed aristocracy today, but a, an equity aristocracy, a, a stock aristocracy. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. Uh, Nick's site is againstcronycapitalism.org. It's one of about five or 10 sites that I check every day. And I recommend that you do the same. Nick, we thank you so much for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.